So um, I'm just going to quickly begin just by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm currently on, Jagger and Turrbal people, as well as the traditional owners of the land on which we're all joining us from on Zoom today, which I'm going to just make sure is doing the right thing. Um, I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, also some quick housekeeping is our bathrooms are just out there or if you head inside up the stairs down the corridor that's them so we're on zoom tonight as well so when we get to question time um, anyone on zoom feel free to type your questions in and uh, I'd like quarter past seven if anyone puts their hand up we can do some questions we've also got Rachel here as an interpreter this evening now my other job is to introduce Ben Hobson this evening so Ben Hobson lives in Brisbane and is entirely keen on his wife, Lena, and their two small boys, Charlie and Henry. He currently teaches English and music at Bradley Island State High School. In 2014, his novella, If the Saddle Breaks My Spine, was shortlisted for the Viva La Novella Prize, run by Seizure Online. To become aware of his first novel, the novel was published in 2017. So I'm going to let Ben take it away. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you very much. Um, I want to just quickly start by introducing Emma, and I want to just say, can we just give a round of applause to Ray? We're all back live, and it's Yay! Emma from the different state. Um, Emma is an amazing person in general. I haven't known her that long, but she seems really cool. Um, her internationally acclaimed Caleb Zellick series has won numerous prizes, including an Ed Kelly Award and an unprecedented five David Awards. And this is the latest one, and from what I hear is maybe the final one, maybe. Sorry, is that a spoiler? Well, sorry, it's not a spoiler. She said that somewhere else. It wasn't me. But this is Emma. Let's welcome her to our state. And welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm so happy to see you all, and I love seeing your smiling faces. Soon we'll have question and answers. But first, I want to thank a few people. First, I want to thank Medina Sumovich. Because this book has a deaf character, Caleb. And I'm hearing, and I feel responsible. I feel, I feel a responsibility. Um, that people can teach me um, about deaf culture, um, about Auslan, about hearing aids, about being deaf, and the deaf community, and the hearing community as well. And then I want to thank my parents. And oh, sorry, oh, and my and my in laws as well. <laughs> First, Jim and Sarah. Um, they they know about Aboriginal culture, and they made sure that I followed the details correctly. For many years, they've been my support. Um, and I'd also like to thank my family, my daughter, Meg, Lena, and my husband, Campbell. Um, writing the book was extremely difficult. And this book in particular was hard and trying to write it through COVID. Um, six lockdowns, yeah. My house is only a small house and we were very crowded together as a family as uh, working and studying, talking and singing. Yeah, it was very loud and crazy. What was even more difficult was 
all, they all put up with me. <laughs> <laughs> they were very, very patient with me and understand me. And their support was wonderful. So I'm very thankful to all of them. So thank you very much. Thank you for that. And thank you, um, Emma. That's uh, really beautiful to watch you do that with your with the crowd. No, it wasn't too bad. Okay, no, no, it looked really good. Um, can we start there though, if that's okay with you? I'm really interested in just that that time that you spent crafting this novel during lockdown with because I'm in the same situation, just having kids in general. Just they're so loud all the time. Like, and the creative practice is one of focused attention so what was it like can you describe the agony at that time in your life <laughs> not politely <laughs> i what once i'm concentrating i'm in the zone a bomb could go off nothing's going to disturb me and getting into that headspace mm. is extremely difficult for me um i was not that long ago diagnosed with adhd which is, is badly named because it's not attention deficit, it's that your attention is one too many things. And, and one of the things that I find extremely distracting is conversation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Got a neighbour over the back fence on the phone outside because you can come inside all the time with a family talking. So that was uh, not fun. Uh, and, and as I you know, signed before, particularly not fun for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. So do you have like a routine? Sorry, do you have like a routine that you get into, like to get into that headspace? Like you have to have the cup of tea just here, or a cup of whiskey. I don't know what you use. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, what is it that gets you right into that zone? That panic, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the best thing for me is when I'm right into the heart of the book, and and when the characters are really coming to life, and I know where I am in the story, and I hate the bit before that where I'm just putting words down the page. So I'm just desperately trying to get to that stage. That's usually what makes me just sit down and just keep writing, keep writing. Um, a lot of coffee. <laughs> and I did take up running again, which just shows you how desperate I was. Um, <laughs> I hate running. I really, really hate it. Uh, but I would go for a run and I'd come back in the house and my family knew not to even look at me. I would just do this. And I'd go into the room and I'd literally have my eyes closed. I go to the room, close the room, white noise on, headphones on, and God forbid anyone to offer me a cup of coffee during the day. <laughs> so you prep your family. That's really smart because I, I just get mad at them when they interrupt the process, which is not so good. It's more I to get in front of it a little bit like you. I think they're scared. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. So run your family with fear, everybody. This is what we're learning here today. But, you know, out of that, I wanted to ask you too, You've been writing now for a while and you've had these four books published in the Caleb Zellick series. But what has been like one of the biggest highlights for you in, in that whole time as an author? Like someone's come up to you and talked to you or it's been a big pinnacle moment. What's a moment like that? It's actually often the small moments. So mm. it's, it's not necessarily fun. Um, when someone says, it's always lovely when someone says they enjoy the book. But when they say, I really connected, or, or that character really meant something, or I understood somebody I know in a different way. Um, and it very much, if it's someone who's deaf or hard of hearing, whether it's small B deaf or small, you know, um, yeah. capital D deaf, if it's um, somebody from the Aboriginal community, because I do have Kuri characters in here. Um, that, that, that goes straight to the heart, absolutely. Mm. Mm. And then, you know, we're going on a bit of a roller coaster here because we started down here where it's agony and pandemic, and we're up here with a highlight, but I want to go back down, like even down, it's way so down. Talking about writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about that moment where you were so, like the worst moment in, in your writing life, in your creative life, where you're like, this is it. You threw a laptop through a window. You're like, I'm done. But then I want to also hear the inspiring story. How did you pick yourself back up and keep going? Which one did you choose? 
Mm. Is there any destruction of property? Because that would be a good one. No, not that I can remember. Okay, not okay. that I have witnesses for. Okay. Uh, one of the most simple, um, but at the time devastating things, was when somebody, um, when I was writing my very first novel, Resurrection Bay, and I was almost at the stage where I was going to send it out to publishers or never send it out to publishers. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was at that, that moment. And I've been loving the experience. I was so enmeshed in the process and the world, and um, it was just such a happy place for me. Uh, and I didn't know anyone in the writing world. Um, and then I spoke to a publisher at, at a, um, an event, and she said, um, nobody wants to read Australian crime fiction. Oh. This is back a few years. This is um, probably seven, eight years ago. Mm. So it was before Australian I'm sure had its space, having a little moment at the moment. Mm. And I'm sure she was correct. I'm sure nobody, nobody yeah. wanted to watch or read it. But I had a, a few weeks of just going, I felt devastated. I felt someone had taken a real joy from my life. But it actually ended up being incredibly positive because I just woke up one day and I'm like, this is free. I don't have to worry about being published. I don't have to worry about whether my novel is marketable. I don't have to, it, it's a busy part of your brain though when you're writing, you've got to put it out of your brain and think about being published at the same time. So I put that to one side and I just get right yeah. what I wanted and I'll lend you to it more. Because um, it is, uh, my books don't quite fit neatly. You know, they're not straight commercial crime fiction. Mm -hmm. They're not bizarre, they're not out like genre, no one would say they're genre busting. But they're very much about characters. They're character driven, but they're also plot driven um, because that's what I like. Yeah, I like about boring people. So, <laughs> do you do you feel like that sometimes can be like it can strangle creativity? That idea of like writing to a market. Do you do you ever find that in the back of your head? Like, oh, I'll make this character super sympathetic, and then people will like them, so I'll give them a dog, and they can pet the dog. But do you find that actually makes it harder to write freely? Um, when I'm thinking of my outside brain, yes, once I get into the book, that, that goes and I write what I want to write, <laughs> I write what I'm enjoying, but before I'm in that headspace, which is one of the reasons why it's so important for me to be in that headspace, <laughs> people might be like, you can't because you end up with this bland nothing. Mm. Um, so, yeah, as much as possible, I try and be aware of that and then to one side. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you can just end up with just words on a page, little cardboard characters moving around. Um, and, and also, if I finish writing a book, that's what it is. I can only write what I'm really keen to write. Yeah, yeah. It just takes too long. It's too, it's too hard to get to that space, too, right? Like, you have to work to get there, so you have to want to write the thing. Mm. Have you ever written something and then looked back on it and gone, oh, whoops, I was writing the wrong thing? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> frequently. Uh, so, <laughs> like, did Caleb ever write a dinosaur or something? Like, never, never, never a dinosaur. Um, I will say that those who perish, and this is not the novel that is in print form, those who perish was at one stage a gothic horror novel. <laughs> <laughs> which I sort of wrote by accident. Um, can we just say it was locked down? And <laughs> there, was a, there was a lot of angst in the world. And um, it I was- I want to know what that book yeah, was. Yes, well, no, I, everyone wants to know, Brandy especially yeah. wants to know. I really actually enjoy, I, I'll enter into it heavily. It was still a tale of novel. Yeah. Um, actually, the plot was the same. The, uh, and those who perish, is set on an isolated windswept island. That was the same, it's gothic, yeah. Mm. But there was also a, a creepy man in a tower called. Oh, I'm, say it. I'm not going to make you say it, but everyone wants you to say it. Look at their faces. Dr. Raven. <laughs> <laughs> there were dead ravens bundled up with twine. It was, it was, I mean, it was quite the thing. Um, and then my. I kind of want to read it. Yeah. I really think it sounds good. <laughs> My lovely editor, when she, she read it, said, oh, it's great. I really love it. Um, it doesn't quite fit the case of the universe. <laughs> What's with all the ravens? <laughs> yeah, 
um, I was thinking I might have to change his name because it's been on the nose. But um, so, so I had to, I, I, I took myself away um, for a couple of weeks. Uh, thank God we're out of lockdown, or it's my poor family. And, and I'm just saying, okay, I have to learn to write like Emma this bitch again instead of Emma Bronte. <laughs> <laughs> So I actually had to read a few chapters of, of my third novel. Does that mean? Really? <laughs> yeah, no, I really did. And read them out loud so that I fell back into my voice again. And then it just clicked and it was fine from then on. But there was this, this weird moment where I'd forgotten to write. Well, what, what was he a doctor in? Like when he had a doctor in him? He was uh, Dr. Raven, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was this? It's like, he was a psychiatrist. Oh, okay, I mean, sorry, my bad. Yeah. No, of course he was. My yeah, bad. Yeah. Sorry. It's a creepy, Silly creepy question. gothic doctor. Yeah, 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 yeah right, right, right. <laughs> okay. Seems fully fleshed out and interesting. Mm -hmm. um, um, the other question I want to ask about before we get into diving into those who perish, which I love, um, I also read that you are a trained musician and that you've played some pretty big gigs and you've, you've, but I was interested in this idea of like how your creativity as a musician has affected your writing. Like, do you feel like there's some cross pollination there between disciplines? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, yeah, so I played, I'm, I'm a clarinet player, and I, and I do, I played um, professionally for kind of yonks years. Um, writing is actually my first love, so I was always sort of there, um, but not, um, I wasn't trying to do it professionally. So they sort of occupied the same pipe. pipe place in my brain to a certain extent. Um, there's a very obvious, you're sitting alone in a room by yourself, doing things for hours and hours. So there's that sort of repetitive focus that I really enjoy. But on the page, um, writing is very much like music to me. It's all about rhythm. Um, there's the structure of the book and the fast and the slows and the mediums and the ups and the downs of the novel. Then it's on the smaller level of the words. Mm. Um, there's a short sentence. So now there's a longer sentence, and maybe you put a few adjectives in it. And now maybe you'll have a medium sentence. So it's it's all about um, contrast, I guess. When you're constructing it, though, are you actually actively thinking of that as you do it, or is it spontaneous? Just like you feel it as you write it. Uh, it's 100% spontaneous to begin with, um, and I feel everything when I'm writing. I don't um, I don't see it. I don't hear it. I feel it. Um, so I, I feel the beats, I feel the dialogue. Um, and then on the rewriting, I'll go, what is not right about this? Oh, it's all been too fast. We just need to take a break or it's all been too slow. Or here's a moment, we, we, we need a joke in here. It's all got a bit dark. Um, and I don't always know what the joke's going to be, but <laughs> I, I, I couldn't be covering letters. Something funny here. <laughs> Please, God, something. <laughs> and then at some stage, hopefully, I'll oh, come up with a joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I wrote down here, I actually felt like reading your books feels like reading Peter Temple to me, like that clipped kind of detective-y, fast-paced, and you sort of have to hold, it feels like I'm holding on to Caleb, I'm just sort of like riding along this roller coaster, rather than this like, you know, I have time to take a breath and step back, I feel like I'm constantly turning, is that something you, you're always writing for a pace deliberately, or is it, again, is it that spontaneous thing that you just feel like that's what a good... Emma Biscuit Prime Novel will do. Not an Emma Bronte. Mm. <laughs> um, again, it starts off from instinct, what I think is going to be good or enjoyable or what I'm going to like. Um, and then I try and find those little cracks in the narrative where I can really get to know the characters more. Um, that's, I often have to really stop and think where they're going to go because you don't want to have them. You don't have a big character reveal moment in the middle of a shootout mm. because you, you're not thinking about that. You drop in little hints um, and get to know the character. So every action, I, I, I try and do a couple of things, um, drive the narrative, get to know the characters better, reveal something, you know, give you some insight, just do, do more than one thing at a time. But it's not the time to do a big, heavy reveal. So that, that's when I sort of sit back and go, okay, we need to get to know the characters more. Where can I do this in the narrative? Um, and just sit with them for a little while. Wow, that's really cool. I, I really appreciate you unpacking that, like that, that idea of writing from instinct, but also using, you know, and then crafting it as well. Like it's a combo of the two things and being a great books. 
Um, I'd like to turn to just the Caleb Zalek series in general. And you mentioned this at the top of your, um, in, when you were signing, um, the, the way that you dive into different communities in this and, and bring voice to a lot of people, I think is really interesting and really authentic and thoughtful. But I wanted to talk about that just quickly. The, um, the First Nations characters in here just feel fully breathing characters, which I really came to know. And I was wondering what went into crafting those characters and the Kuri people, as you mentioned, um, in an authentic and thoughtful way. Well, I think you always need to start writing from a place of empathy mm. and knowledge. Um, so I didn't know anything about deafness when I first started writing the Carbon novels. So I had to learn a lot. Um, and there was a very, um, the very practical side of learning on slam, talking to people, listening to people, trying to learn to lip read, failing terribly. So there was a bit of that side. Um, I had to seek out the knowledge um, with the Puri characters. Um, that's because um, it's part of my life. It's part of my world. I'm not Indigenous, but I have um, an extended family who are. And they've been a huge, huge part of my life, um, huge um, influence on me. So when I first started writing the Caleb books, I knew that the balance between deaf and First Nations people was brilliant because they've had very similar histories. Denied um, language, but forced not to have language. Uh, denied the right to have children or marry. Or, or, or be a citizen. So we've got those um, those mirrors. Caleb's wife, ex-wife Kat, um, because she's Puri, she's that nice mirror, but she comes from a very strong, very supportive family. Um, and you can see the difference between having a big extended supportive family as opposed to Caleb, who's not allowed to be deaf when he's a child. Mm. So he's not part of the hearing community or the deaf community at the beginning of the book, so it's partly the journey. So I knew that they would be the balance, um, but I thought long and hard about whether I should or could write Indigenous yeah. characters. And, and I think in the end it came down to, I mean, I've spoke to my family about it, but it, it came down to how I was writing them and why I was writing them. And because I write the world around me, but also because I'm writing from the same perspective. Caleb has the same perspective as me. Mm. He is an outsider who's been allowed in. Yeah. So we, we both have that same days. Um, so that's where I, I felt that I said, is that constantly? Yeah, yeah. I really appreciate that. And to talk quickly too about the um, the deaf community as well, um, you, you opened again, you spoke, I'm sorry, I've, I've written down her name, it's Medina. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk about just the way that you, you dove into that community as well and how, again, like, not only is your character deaf and, you know, it's so authentically portrayed just physically, but just, like, there's a lot in there about the community and things that I would have had no idea about if I hadn't read your book and I can then, you know, empathise with that community. So what went into crafting that? How did um, Dina help with that as well? So it's been a long process. When um, help one came out, Resurrection Bay, he is very much that uh, loner detective, totally isolated, estranged from family, estranged from friends. He's small d deaf, which means he's profoundly deaf, um, but he's not part of the community. So um, although I have a lot to do with the deaf community and learning Auslan and talking to people and just getting to know them, um, I wasn't writing about the deaf community for Dan mm. because he's not part of it. But a lot of books have been about his journey to finding his place in the world. So as I went through the books, I started drawing on my knowledge and talking to people more and more. So my third novel, we see the deaf community for the third, first time in the novels. And so with those who perish, I knew that that was going to be part of it. Is he going to be part of the hearing community or the deaf community or nothing at all? Is he going to go back to where he started? It's not that. Is it a homecoming or is it a step back and, and going back to yeah. the gumshoe? You can never change. Um, so that was 
like talking to a lot of people and hearing their stories and just reading. And Medina um, was one part of that, a big, big part of that, because she reads my novels. I pay her. <laughs> She's like so incredibly generous. Yeah, yeah. I want to say I pay her because you shouldn't ask people to you know, work for free with that sort of thing. Absolutely. Um, and she reads them and she says, yeah, you got that right. Mm, that, oh, I don't know about that word. And um, and then laughs at the sign name. So these people have come up with way better sign names. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. So, yeah, so she, she does push back on the things that are inauthentic. Yeah, that's so oh, valuable. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, I wanted to also ask you this because I love Caleb, even though he's messy and he's got his, you know, He's got his idiosyncrasies and things that aren't maybe as attractive as a character trait. Like, I love him even then. But I want to ask you, what do you find most attractive about Caleb? Like, if you knew him in person, which I guess you do, right? I feel like knowing better than... Yeah, you, you definitely do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one's watching this. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just goes out into the But, yeah, what do you find attractive about him? Some of his characteristics, his personality. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know, I'm sure <laughs> even with someone you hate, you could find something you liked. I, I actually enjoy spending time with him because he's uh, one of those stubborn characters. And and I need to preface this by saying, I know he's not real, it's okay. But when you spend a lot of time writing a character, you know, the back of your brain, they're there all the time. Um, I do like he um, he's really stubborn independence, um, even though it's really annoying for these writers sometimes. So I go, he just wouldn't. Just wouldn't be cooperative. It's got to do with the opposite. Um, I do find that quite entertaining, but but also um, he's very dry humoured about <laughs> people being assholes to him. Usually, not always, but like he can just push back in in this very um, you might say just two words, and the person he's talking to won't necessarily know that he's having a go at them, but we know hopefully. <laughs> Uh, something I really liked about him was just the way that he seems to be able to do the right thing, even though he knows what the consequences could be. And, you know, I don't want to get into too much of the plot, but there's a particular scene where he stands up to someone and he knows it's going to wreck the relationship. But he's just like, no, I have to, because it's the right thing. I have to do this thing. I really think that's quite admirable in him. Is that in you as well? Like you just. Oh, I'm a terrible coward. <laughs> and a complete people pleaser. Um, some of the great things about writing characters is that you get to write the opposite. Yeah. yeah. So um, Caleb is very, very, very brave. I'm not. Um, I do have a very strong moral compass, though. Um, so that's that's probably where we we're the same. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, this is this is you being Caleb, right? It's taking a stand on things. That's right. Um, can you talk a little bit about the title? I was actually super jealous of you when you came up with this title because I think you posted about it and you said I've got the best title and you posted those who perish. Oh, damn it. That's, that's <laughs> so bad with titles. I know writers and the audience are on there like just titles, but you always seem to come up with these great titles. I love titles. No, see that's weird. Yeah, I don't understand. Yeah. But it's from the Bible. It's from two Thessalonians. It actually happened in the start. The quote is those who perish could have been saved but they did not receive the love of truth. Which I think talks a lot about it. But yeah, how did you find that? Did you just read the Bible back to front. That's okay. fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's really funny. Um, so, <laughs> two lax Catholics as parents. I, I, I wasn't raised religious at all, but you know, you, it surrounds us. Yeah, yeah, it surrounds you. Um, and I love titles, and I, I'm often writing towards one. So the book has to be um, forming for me to get the right titles. So when I start going, oh, that's what this book's about. And, and I have uh, 50 tabs open for Bible Hub quotes. <laughs> and then I start sort of thinking of synonyms for words that maybe I can yeah. use. Um, and perish was one of them. And I kept, you know, bouncing. This goes on for months, months and months and months. Uh, I often but you like, enjoy oh, this. Oh, I love it. Right. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I really, really do. <laughs> it's weird to me. I don't understand. It's torture to me. Like, I never, never feel good about titles. It's, uh, I mean... Can you describe the feeling? Like, what did it feel like when you found it? Like, did you just shut your laptop like I'm done for the day and went and had a drink? <laughs> no. Um, I think it's... I, I often doubt myself. I go, oh, maybe there's a better one, maybe there's a better one. 
Um, but, but there is a sense of relief because it's always when I work out what the core of the book is about. Mm. So those who perish, do they perish? Maybe they do, you know, and, and what is the truth? And can we acknowledge truth? And okay, it's just how we teach truth in the Bible. It's about the word of the Lord. Um, and they're all Old Testament um, titles. But in this, it's do you face up to the truth? Do you walk away? And because it is um, the final, series, um, I felt that it needed to be about homecoming and whether you accept where you are in the world or whether you, whether you can get redemption, I guess. Jeez, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> can you bottle that somehow and give it to writers? Like, I feel. Just give me, give me, a, give me a things, and I'll come back to you in two years' time. Is that open to everyone? I just, yeah. <laughs> you guys heard it here. It depends how much whiskey you buy. <laughs> um, I also wanted to talk about this novel in particular, separate from the previous three. Was there anything different? And you wrote this in the pandemic as well. So, was there anything different in how you actually went about? structuring this, writing this? Was there a habit that you changed? You said you went for runs. Yeah, I drank a lot more too. <laughs> and then I stopped. Um, but there was nothing different in the structure. In the, I always start off going, I'm going to be more organised this time mm. and I'm going to have more idea of what I'm going to write. But whenever I do that, um, it's bloodless, absolutely bloodless. I end up deleting it. Um, so with this one, I thought I was probably only a few thousand words into it. I went, no, I'm just going to stop trying to write um, linearly and I'm just going to do my usual random stuff, which is I usually have a few scenes that I'm writing towards. So, so I allowed myself to not try and do what I thought I should do and I just really leant into it. So here's a scene, here's a sentence, here's a chapter, here's another scene. So just randomly throughout the whole, scattered throughout. Well, that's what I always do, but I just lent it to it this time. Um, and then when it's almost all together, then I have to really sit and work out where I've gone wrong, <laughs> where I need to delete, what I need to write more of, and that's where the real structural work begins. Yeah, but delete, delete Dr. To... Raven. Yeah. That's with Dr. Raven. Okay. But see, I think that's interesting too, because that obviously that creative thing did become this eventually. Yeah, it was actually, you were free to sort yeah, of do that. It was actually a really, really easy switch once I got the mood right. Um it just it changed really, really easily. But yeah, maybe I needed that to, to get there in yeah, the yeah. Um and then why why so why the island specifically as a part of the gothic thing originally, but it's you know it's obviously then isolating the characters a little bit. Talk to us about the inspiration mm. for that. I love island settings. Uh, the setting I actually came up with about five years ago, uh, maybe even longer. I have, I have a friend who's, who's a great um, bird watcher and she told me about an island in Western Port Bay, Victoria, which has got no council, no sewage, no electricity. That's very similar set up um, as um, Mountain Bed Island in those who perish. Oh, it's brilliant. It's so close to the mainland, but it's totally isolated. You have to catch ferry there. Um, and so it's been in my mind ever since and, and obviously morphed immensely because um, the island in Victoria is it's farming land. There was a prison down there for a long time and actually the mosquitoes that make it into this book were true. Oh, yeah. Huge, huge mosquitoes. Um, but it became this really uh, windy, rocky, hilly place in my head. So when I came to write this parish, I knew I was sort of writing towards that island and I wanted that feeling of real claustrophobia mm. and there's nothing like an island to give you that, you know, feeling of, oh, my God, here we are, we can't get off, I'm trapped. Yeah, I felt like every time scary. I went over there on the ferry, it felt like that, like it was, it was like going through that, River sticks or whatever it is, mm. right? Like it felt like that. Oh no! Like it's completely shut off. Yeah, and, and he's, each time he goes over, even though it's not a long distance, he's leaving his wife, Cat, who is heavily pregnant, and he's trying desperately to be with her and for them to, after some really rocky years in the relationship, <laughs> be a family. And so he has to. He's torn. He's, you know, it's that really physical sensation of being yeah. pulled in both directions, and but he has to keep going back to the island because. 
he's trying to save his beloved brother Ant, so he's he's pulled in two directions. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's very clever. You're a clever person. Definitely. Yes. You've got that on Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are going to open up questions very shortly. I've just got one more question, and I think afterwards we're going to have Emma actually sign some books. I'm first, though. You can all get out of the way. I'm going first. All right. Um, but the last question I want to ask, so start thinking of questions of your own. Um, I think Caleb's journey in this book, and I think over the course, is really emotionally rich. And it's really, and like you say, that idea of redemption and then turning a focus on yourself and looking at yourself actually, like this idea of looking at yourself truthfully, I think is really interesting with Caleb. But then also the emotional journey that he goes on with his ex-wife, wife, ex-wife ex slash, you know, um, cat. But um, what were some of the emotional beats in Caleb that you just really wanted to focus on or really enjoyed focusing on in, this, in the writing of this, the final one? Mm. Not to spoil stuff, though. We won't, we won't go into the ending. The, I'll preface that by saying definitely the final one of the series. But... I, last time you talked uh, about it, you had a question mark on that. You didn't say oh, no, that. No, no, it's definitely the last of this series that more and more I'm drawn to at some stage doing a jump in time and seeing how it's getting on five years down the track or so. We'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm slow. Um, yeah, so from the start with Resurrection Bay, I knew that I wanted a character, or all characters, but particularly Caleb, um, to grow and change which is one of the reasons it's a short series, because there needs to be an arc. And if you just keep going and going and going, it's very hard to keep the character changing. So I wanted him to start as being uh, emotionally unintelligent, um, willfully, um, you know, stubborn and acting against his own good and the people around him. Yeah. But I wanted him also to then learn to change because at the heart, the books are about family and Caleb kind of wants family, yeah. whatever form that family is. So he's been trying to change, trying to change. And so with those who perish, I wanted to put him in a situation where it was pretty impossible for him. He's choosing between looking after his wife, looking after his brother, looking after himself and go, okay, can you keep changing, mate? Or are you going to go back to, mm. you know, that snakes the ladders, you're going back to the beginning again. So, yeah, I just wanted to torture him a bit, basically. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah and not, again, not to spoil stuff, but it does feel really burned that the way where we leave him, which we feel like, okay, it's not just everything's a ticked box. Like, it feels like it's really authentic, which I've said a lot of times, but that's the main thing I find in your books is this authenticity. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are there any questions from Zoom or anyone in the audience have a question for Emma? Remember, she's from another state, so it's very special that she's here. When's the television series coming uh, out? <laughs> it has been optioned. Yeah. But I can't say that it will because oh. who knows? Soon. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Anybody else? Right, I should be asking a question. Um, so, Emma, you're talking about your sort of patchwork way into the novel and I'm wondering if you know where you're going like you're ending or if you're totally unnatural like Solari and Michael Robotham and um, a panzer. So you're a panzer or a plotter? I am as far as the ending. But disgusting. <laughs> but the difference is because Solari and who you're talking about, I'm not sure if Michael Robotham is the same but she starts at the beginning and writes through to the yes. I don't do that. No. Okay. I write forward, backwards, upside down, around. I'm just, it's everywhere. At some stage in the process, if I'm lucky, I go through, I know where it's ending. Okay. Uh, I always know the emotional ending of the book, right? So I knew exactly the emotional ending I wanted to get. I didn't know how it was going to get them to plot all the characters. So. Even that first one? Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. So I think I'm, I'm with Miranda. Like I, I can even get behind pantsing a little bit, so I sort of do that myself. But I go in an order so I can see how it unfolds, but you write like a weird thing halfway through and then, uh, that's weird. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. Sorry, it's great. No, I wish I could do what you're doing. It'd be so, it'd be so much quicker. I would have to delete so much. You know, less. Yeah, but again, like, 
That's why they're so good. That's why it's your, it's your process. Well, I just, and when I say weird, I don't mean like negative. <laughs> I do. <laughs> oh, Randy does. Randy's me. No, but <laughs> we just mean unique, like it's unique to you, and every writer has their own journey, right? Yeah, their own process. I think you just sort of lean into the, the way you do it. Yeah. And, and, and then refuse to do that and then go back to the other time. <laughs> yeah, because you read a book by some other author who convinces you you've got to plot everything out on cards, all the emotional bits and highlight everything. And then you try, it doesn't work, go back. The one good thing is it does surprise me. Yeah, that's that's go, oh, okay, that's who the murder is. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously I have to go back and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. Wow. But I actually love quite it. like that. Thing. Love it. Yeah, it's kind of cool. We've got any other questions? Well, I just wonder if you're a pantser, how do you know this is the last book or is there a, <laughs> does something happen? Uh, because I know, I know the emotional ending of it. I know where it, I'm leaving Caleb. Okay. Yeah, oh. yeah. So it's about your relationship. That's right. <laughs> Caleb and he's is just definitely said enough. <laughs> yeah, it, it needed to, it to feel that he was in a place, a, a bookend of the of Resurrection Day, basically. But yeah, yeah we'll see. Maybe we'll meet him again in another five years or so. Maybe. I don't know if you want to answer this or something, but that's what he's doing. But what's next? Wow, well, still. I'm right. Wow. Well, I'm in the early stages of writing. What a different novel based on a. Dr. Raven. <laughs> It's actually historical uh, and it's based on a sort of a violent family event that happened. Um, yeah, so oh, wow. it's been in my head for a long time. So, great. Yeah. Sounds really exciting. Are there any other questions at all? Anybody else? Hi. Um, when you start to write um, your Aboriginal Indigenous characters, um, I'm having sort of trouble. Uh, I've got a couple of characters who are Indigenous, but it's my first time writing Indigenous characters, and it's and I asked Brandy last night a question about a certain scene. Um, how did you overcome? Like, were you uncomfortable? Like, writing? Yeah, I think if you're not worried about it, you shouldn't be doing it. Basically, I mean, um, there, there are very few absolutes in writing, um, but that's my feeling, is that if you're going into this thinking that there's no problems, um, <laughs> yeah, don't do it, <laughs> don't do it. Uh, and the other thing I would think is um, you've got to ask yourself why you're doing it. Um, is it just because you want it on the page? Is it something um, that is personally connected to you? So, yeah, I, I think you can start with, with those two things, um, are you feeling uncomfortable about it? Is that a good thing or is it showing that you, that you need to go in a different direction and then why? Yeah. But it's, it's a long process, absolutely. Yeah. Anybody else? We've still got a few minutes, so Ben, if you have more All questions. Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, sorry. it becomes, yeah, it becomes quiet. a scary one. No, no, no. It's a, I have rapid fire questions at the end, just in case there's, a, there's a, no hands that go up. But, um, biggest influences as an author, who would you point to? Oh, no. Top three, go. No, 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 I can't do that. Oh, what? No. Oh. What about just crime? What about just, just crime? crime? No, no, no. no. Okay. okay, I'll tell you what. Um, oh, sorry. Why not? Why? Um, because I, I don't know. I, I don't write towards anyone. And I think every book I've ever read in my life, I, I know it sounds like a cop out, but no, every book no, I've ever this, read yeah. in my life has had a huge influence on me. Even ones that I've hated. Yeah. So you know, I, I can go back to like, I can go back to in the black, you know, Greek myths, um, Rachel Cusk at the moment. Like, it's an incredibly different style for me. Or Ernest Stroud, my name is mm. Lucy Bart. I love that novel. Mm. That novel has no plot. Nothing happens. A woman lies in a hospital bed and speaks to her mother. Mm. I love it. So um, I can't. Yeah, I can't. can't it down. It's really cool. So you just take bits of everything. Yeah, usually I'm intentionally, but but if I'm really good at making myself concentrate, that's why. Yeah, cool. I mean, we were talking about the monkey's mask by yeah, yeah. Dorothy Porter recently, and in rereading that, I could see that she had a huge influence on me but at the time. Mm -hmm. That's funny to go back and unpack that. Um, what about some new Australian voices in, in fiction, even crime fiction, that you're really enjoying at the moment? Well, there's um, someone sitting in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a beautiful new book. 
uh, called the Burnished um, Sun, which I just started yeah. at Marandi. Um, I have a couple of short stories in this beautiful crime fiction. There's a, there's a slew of fantastic new crime writers out there. Um, Danuka McKenzie's out of the torrent. Um, we've got the Silent Listener. Was just, I've, I've just recently read that. That's fantastic. Um, it's just I would say everyone should go to an, a Bible called Southern Cross Crime and just mm -hmm. read a whole lot of the authors in that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and what would you say would be some advice you'd have for some aspiring crime novelists or even just novelists in general? What's the best piece of advice? Mm. Depends on the day for the advice for you, Chris. Um, <laughs> just keep writing, basically. And I know that sounds really basic, but you just have to keep writing. And don't be writing towards publication. Um, and yes, I'm sitting here on the four books, so that sounds you know a bit on the nose. <laughs> but I'd love to tell you that time when I was told that no one would read Australian crime fiction, it was freeing, it really was. So you've got to have it in your mind that you're working towards publication, and then you just gotta throw that away and write the book that is right for you to write. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think we do have a Zoom question. Oh, okay, let's hear it. Um, tips for mastering the opening chapter. They say the first 50 pages is make or break for setting up the plot. Yeah, probably fewer than 50 pages, I'd say, these days, particularly with crime. Uh, yeah. Capturing a reader, I'd say, a paragraph. Capturing them, yeah, yeah. The first chapters are so hard. <laughs> uh, my best advice is don't try and write it first. If you're a linear writer, um, sure, put something down on the page but be willing to totally ditch that as you get further into the book because it's not actually until you've written most of the book or all of the books that you really have to, you know, tie that together. So do that. And then what can you leave out of the first chapter? Don't start with backstory. You're going to sprinkle that in like little breadcrumbs through the first three, four chapters just to leave the reader into a little dark forest of your imagination. Don't start with it. <laughs> Yeah, I was reading um, To Kill a Mockingbird for a few years ago as a high school teacher and the opening chapter is just all exposition and backstory, which is you know, obviously brilliant. That's fine. Well, yeah. Well, but yeah, it's a different time now. We, we read differently, we have different attention scans. Um, yeah, it was funny to go back and read that book. And just... I agree with it recently too. Yeah. I the same thing. I love that book. The first chapter wouldn't get published now. Mm -hmm. No, no. You're cutting it, <laughs> like you said, right? <laughs> Um, I think that's all my questions. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody um, else? All right. I did want to also say, I was only joking before. I'm not going to go and push my way in front of the line. Not like that. Okay, <laughs> guys. That was just a joke. Emma will be open for all of you guys to go and get your book signed. Um, yeah, but let's all thank Emma. Woo! Thank you so much, guys. That was brilliant. Rachel, you were so good at all. Alrighty, so if everyone wants to get on inside, you can grab a book, get it signed. Thanks, guys. That was amazing. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. Oh, that was super interesting. <laughs> <laughs>